Hello and welcome to today's meeting of Democrats of Greater Tucson. My name is Larry Bodine and I'm the president and I'll be your host today. And I hope everybody had a delicious and wonderful 4th of July, got to see people, have your eardrums blown off by all the fireworks. Let's start with Steve Linder. Steve, tell us about why you belong to DGT and, and why other people should do the same. Yes, it's uh, it's been my pleasure to be a, a part of DGT for a number of years. And it's the one place we can go to where we can hear interesting topics just about every every week from people who are like-minded, encourage people to get involved and go further after their speeches and things. We, we can take that information and go further. It's the one organization that enables us to do this, whether we're meeting in person, hopefully in the future, or on as we are now, we still have that opportunity. And that's why I'm encouraging anybody who is not currently a member to join. And you can go to the website, Click on the box that says join and uh, become a member of our organization. And I certainly think it's only $20 for a year. Very reasonable. I certainly encourage people to do that. So please join our organization. Thanks a lot, Steve. And let's turn now uh, to Sandy Binion to tell us about upcoming programs. Sandy, go right ahead. Hi, and thank you, Miranda, for agreeing to speak today. Next week on the 12th, Andre Tromo. Is, is, uh, who's the representative from LD3 is going to tell us about all the horrors that went on in the state legislature and the state house last year. The following week, we have Randy Freed, who is announced for candidate, well, what is presently LD2 for Congress, Katie Hobbs, who is, of course, announced for governor of Arizona. And she's going to tell us why we should be voting for her. She's one of three now that have announced. Of course, we all heard one of them, um, um, Marco Lopez, a couple of weeks ago. That will round out the month of July. And then I have other things coming up in August. So hopefully you can all join us. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you for all your hard work lining up our wonderful speakers. We have an announcement from Lucy Messing. Go ahead, Lucy. Hello, DGT. I wanted to let people know about the change that we're having for the Tanker Verde Dems. Late last week, I got a notice from Catherine Hoffman's office that, that she has a scheduling conflict for this month, so she's going to try and join us next month. So instead of having Catherine Hoffman and the mayor Rahina will still be joining us on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. We're going to have all three of our LD10 legislators join us, and they will be giving us a wrap up of the disastrous legislative session. You can get the link on our Facebook page or contact me. I hope to see you all there to, to hear the mayor and our LD10 legislators. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Appreciate the update. Hi, everybody. I would love to invite you to our next uh, Drinking Democratically Happy Hour. We hope to have it in July. The only problem is, is the venue we've used for the last two months is not available. So I'm reaching out to my fellow Democrats here. If anybody has a idea for a restaurant, a restaurant slash bar that has a room, something like we were using at the Augustine Kitchen downtown, that uh, would be willing to work with us um, to have our happy hour, to please email me those ideas or call me. I put my information in the chat early in the meeting. Um, I'll put it in again, but if y'all would please, you know, come up with some ideas. Maybe there's a, there's a, a restaurant or a bar in your neighborhood um, that you would like for us to patronize. We were able to meet at Augustine Kitchen in Mer uh, Mercado downtown. We just met, had a great time talking face-to-face with, with fellow Democrats, a wide range of conversations go on, and it's just a fun time, a nice way to, to get out without any restrictions, being able to talk. There's no speaker at these events. It's just us talking to each other. So if you have any ideas, give me a call. Let's turn now to our speaker, Miranda Lopez. Let me do a quick introduction. Miranda started as the new director of the Pima County Democratic Party in March. 
She graduated from the U University of Arizona in Tucson in 2018. And then she worked as a Democratic organizer in Flagstaff for the 2018 midterms. A native of Phoenix, she was a regional organizing director for the 2020 campaign in charge of a team of 13 organizers. After the election, she returned to the Pima County Democratic Party as the operations coordinator, and she was promoted to director by County Chair Bonnie Heidler. And today, Miranda is preparing for the Pima County Democratic Party's Yes, We Can Climate Action Fundraiser, which takes place on July 17th. Democrats of Greater Tucson is a sponsor of the event with speaker Michael Mann, who has a new book out, and he's a climate scientist at Penn State. Miranda is also working on voter registration and activation, legislative vacancies, fundraising, and volunteers. And with that, Miranda, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Larry and Sandy, for inviting me to speak here today. This is actually perfect because you basically covered all of my first slide, which was just to introduce <laughs> um, you all to myself. I'm from Phoenix originally, and I was an organizer for the coordinated campaign, um, both in 2018 and 2020. I'm super excited to be on board with everybody. I hope that this is uh, informative to, to everybody about what's what's been going on with the Pima County Democrats. But essentially what I want to do is I want to cover the basics of how uh, us as, as the Pima County Democratic Party are working towards 2022, some of the next steps that you all can take in terms of getting involved, and then not really the basics of, of Pima politics and government, but more at who are the main players this year in terms of the, the 2022 campaign and how we're going to be working with them, aka the coordinated and the state party and, and, and things like that. The party organizing structure. So uh, I know you all must be very familiar by this point with how uh, the party structure works, but I just want to give like a quick review in case anyone has any questions about that. So first of all, we have the precinct committee people, which are the central link between the voters and the legislative districts. Then you also have the legislative districts. Then there's the county party, which is mostly what I operate out of. And then there's the, the state party. So the precincts are, it's the smallest unit of our party as Democrats, there's not really a lot that you have to like, you know, do in order to become a PC. You just need to be a registered Democrat and you have to actually live in the precinct that you want to, to represent. This is actually one of our, our biggest focuses in terms of what we're trying to build for next year. So we want to have more PCs. There are a couple of different committees right now in the Pima County Democratic Party, including a precinct committee development team, which is basically working on how can we get all of the PCs kind of on the same page in terms of what they need to know as PCs and what are the best resources for them. And in addition to that, just recruiting PCs is one of our biggest priorities right now. So if anyone is not a PC and you're currently, if you're interested in learning more about that, let me know, uh, contact me and I can uh, help you get that process started. But um, they're very essential to what we as the, the county party do. It's, it's one, of the, the, one of the biggest priorities right now. In terms of the legislative districts, so if you ever hear me say LD, that's, that's what I'm talking about is a legislative district. We have seven within um, Pima County. Uh, some of them actually cross over into different counties. Um, but these are, um, if you go a little bit closer to Tucson, this is the, the general outlines of all of them. So you have um, LD9 is kind of that Catalina Foothills area. LD10 is like the east side of, of Tucson. LD14 actually goes all the way down. Um, it includes Vail. It, um, it, it goes really far down south. Same with um, LD2 and LD, LD4 stretches um, further west. Um, LD3 is, is there. And then also LD11 includes like Oro Valley, um, and actually extends up into uh, Pinal County. Um, and so the way that the PCs kind of fit into the LDs is that the PCs are the tiny, tiny little, little sections. Um, and what's kind of interesting is that the, the precinct itself doesn't change much in terms of um, your, 
well, year to year, decade to decade uh, redistricting, but the LDs can change um, quite significantly. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit as well uh, later on in the, in the presentation. Um, so then you have the, the county party, which works with the LDs who are in turn working with their PCs in each of their um, districts. So we have our, our county chair, our first vice chair, second uh, corresponding secretary, recording secretary, and our treasurer. Um, all of these uh, officers form the executive committee, which also has um, additional um, people such, such as the LD chairs and anyone who's been appointed to the executive committee. Um, and then the county committee is actually, um, you know, you have all the PCs that are in the county and we are actually gonna be having a meeting so that we can vote on some uh, platform changes in, in August. Um, but if you've heard some of these terms before, that's kind of what it's, uh, what it's referring to. And the way that I kind of fit into this is that I was hired essentially by the executive committee um, to help uh, execute uh, some of these uh, strategies that we're, that we're working on right now. Okay, uh, state party. So the Arizona Democratic Party is the one that leads all of the county parties, but on a statewide level. Um, it's not necessarily that they that they tell us what to do, um, but we do take their lead um, in a lot of different areas. Um, they also are um, actually a really great resource for us when it comes to um, if we need like emergency funding or, or something like that. Um, you have the state committee, which is it's like the executive committee for us, but statewide. Um, so you have the different county chairs that make up that. You also have the ADLCC, it's the Arizona Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee. So if you've heard of these guys and you kind of have like no idea what, what that means, that's fine. I also was very unsure until like three months ago, but basically it's, it's a certain arm of the Arizona Democratic Party that is really focused on the state races. So the, um, the state house and the state Senate seats for all the LDs, that's its very particular focus. Um, because as you'll see in some of these upcoming slides, um, some of these races can get left behind in terms of um, coordinated efforts. Uh, so voter turnout. In 2018, there was 70% voter turnout in Pima County, which was actually higher than the 65% turnout throughout all of Arizona. And it was really due to that um, really high turnout in Pima County that we were able to flip a U.S. Senate seat, Secretary of State, you know, public instruction and LD10 uh, representative seat as well was, was one that we were able to grab. One of the closest statewide races was uh, called under less than 20,000 votes. And one of the closest local races was actually less than 13,000 votes. Now the next year, so notice how the, the turnout numbers went up and actually the, those closest races, those numbers went down. So we had actually 82% turnout in Pima County in 2020, which is incredible. Um, and there was 80% turnout overall in Arizona. We got U.S. president. We got vice president. We got a, another U.S. Senate seat. We got Pima County sheriff, apparently. I wasn't even aware of that. We actually did lose uh, a couple of seats um, in the state house and state Senate, including here in Pima County. We lost a state representative seat in LD4. The closest statewide race was under 11,000 votes, and that was actually the race for president. Joe Biden won Arizona by less than 11,000 votes statewide. Um, the closest local race that we had was actually for the uh, Pima County Board of Supervisors District 1 race with Rex Scott. He won that race by about 730 votes. So basically what I wanted to outline with these numbers is that as the turnout goes up, the margins go down um, and the races get closer and closer. And the turnout for this upcoming midterm is expected to be higher than the uh, turnout was in 2018. Um, and so naturally what that, what that means is that the margins are gonna be even closer. And so really every vote um, is going to count um, every vote that we can turn out is going to make a significant difference um, in, in the final outcome of a lot of these races, both up and down the ballot. 
So what does that mean for us in terms of coordinating? So there are a few different groups who are involved. Um, so it's not just the Pima County Democratic Party. You also have the uh, Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. They are very likely to be involved in the race for Congressional District 2. There are actually uh, three um, candidates for uh, Congressional District 2 currently, and there's probably going to be more. So you have Dr. Randy Fries, you have Kristen Engel, and then you also have Daniel Hernandez, um, who's currently a state representative. The, the D-TRIP is going to be a, a pretty significant player in the CD2 race. The Arizona Democratic Party is actually doing its own organizing program. So this is completely separate from the coordinated campaign. This is called the 1530 Project. They are organizing statewide. It's a lot smaller than the coordinated campaign. So there's only going to be maybe a dozen organizers total throughout the entire state. But what the objective of this group is, is to work specifically with county chairs and the county parties and to work within the communities themselves and completely focus on the lower end of the ticket. Um, so really those state Senate and state house races. And I'm actually, I'm really excited about working with these guys because uh, the, the guy who's in charge, Hunter Henderson, um, he and I are actually from the same town. Uh, so we have, we have a lot in common there. Um, we've been in constant contact uh, pretty much every week. We give each other updates about what's going on. And um, the Pima County party is also heavily involved with the actual hiring of these organizers, which is supposed to be finalized by kind of mid July. So that's something that we're working on actually right now. So this isn't something that's going to happen like maybe a few months from now or next year. Like, no, this is happening like in a couple of weeks. So super exciting. Then we've also got the Arizona Coordinated Campaign, which some of you might know as Mission for Arizona. So again, this is not the state party necessarily. It is the state coordinated campaign. Um, and the thing about coordinated campaigns is they are actually mainly run by the um, by the by the DNC essentially like the national party um, and each state has its own coordinated campaign depending on like funding and like when a primary is and all these different factors so they are primarily focused a little bit higher in the ballot so usually in their scripts if, and if any of you have volunteered with the coordinated campaign before It'll say something along the lines of, are you supporting Democrats up and down the ballot? Um, but then they'll also have a few specific questions about people like Mark Kelly or Joe Biden. Um, but um, we've actually been working really closely with them over the last few months as they're getting ready to start um, hiring more staff and, and all of that. Uh, I'm actually um, have a lot of personal relationships with the people who are um now in charge of the coordinated campaign. And we've all agreed that it's way better to, to be in like constant communication with each other and to like work more closely together in order to, for everyone to, to get, um, cause you know, we all have the same goal and, and in order to, for everyone to get that goal, um, it's better to make sure that they know what support is needed, um, that we're not fighting over resources that we're not duplicating um, voter outreach efforts. And so know that that coordination started uh, a couple of months ago and it's going, it's going really well. Um, they are also coordinating with the state party as well. There's just, there's a lot of talking that's, that's happening, which is, which is really good. Um, Cause normally this kind of talking wouldn't happen until like, you know, three months before the election. Um, so I'm, again, this is something that I'm really excited about. And um, if anyone has any questions about this, um, feel free to ask, but uh, yeah, I feel really great about it. All right, um, some other organizations that we're either trying to coordinate with, or we're going to be having some sort of like round table with them um, include Lucha, Mi Familia Vota, um, AZ List, Indivisible, Field Team 6, and then there's the Voters' Right to Know Act, which you all may know as Dark Money um, or the Dirty Money Campaign. You know what? Third time's the charm. I think we're going to do it this year. Um, we have their petitions um, for the initiative in our office. 
Um, we're also making sure to have those petitions available at any um, in-person events that we have. Um, so that's something that we're um, super supportive of this year um, because, you know, it's it's ridiculous at this point. Like this is something that that has to get onto onto the ballot. Um, Lucha Mi Familia Vota, it's a little more complicated there because they are specifically nonpartisan, but the work that they are doing in their communities is like super, super important. And we just wanna make sure that anything that they are doing, we're not like duplicating that. Um, and we're just trying to um, stay in contact with them. Um, AZ List is a program that um, works to elect uh, women specifically in office. Um, and we actually have uh, their direct, their political director, Claire Knight. Uh, she works out of our office. Um, and so we're always in constant contact with them. Um, we're really excited to uh, make sure that, uh, you know, they keep us in the loop and we keep them in the loop about potential candidates and all of that. Um, Indivisible, as always, is just like, it, it's truly one of the um, most impactful um, community organizations that I've, I've seen in, in Tucson. And so um, people who are involved with Indivisible, um, we haven't been able to reach out yet, but those are definitely people that we wanna coordinate with. Um, and then Field Team Six, they're slightly, they're slightly different thing. Um, they are a California-based group from what I understand. And they basically, they recruit volunteers to all fly into you know, one city in a battleground state and then just, just to register voters. Um, we, uh, I'm pretty sure we know a few people who, who work with them. So um, that's some, somebody we're gonna be working with as well. So there's just, there's a lot of different, <laughs> there's a lot of different levels to um, all the coordinating that's happen, happening this year. All right, so I'm gonna get into biggest challenges because I feel like I've been talking for a really long time. All right, so as the uh, biggest challenges for the Pima County Democrats, there are three main ones that we're having that, um, you know, I wanted to come in and talk to you about today. Um, so you've seen the work that, you know, we've done and the work that we're continuing to do. And now I want you to see um, kind of what we're facing and how you can get involved. So redistricting, this is going to be the main issue. Um, there is an independent redistricting committee who has selected a certain mapping consultant that was not on the top of our priority list. Um, and in addition to all of this, Arizona, we have not gotten a 10th congressional seat. Um, so that was kind of a, a blow. Um, because of the redistricting and because of the inaccurate census results, we, it, it's just become this, this great unknown for us. It is this um, unknown factor that we know is going to have a significant impact on everything that we do, but we have no way to tell exactly how it's going to have an impact. Um, we know that the LD boundaries and the numbers are gonna change. It's probably not going to be finalized until early 2022. And what that means is that anyone who is running for a specific seat in an LD, they may not be running uh, for that they, they basically have no idea what they're running for at this point because they don't know what that district is going to look like. Um, and then it's also challenging because if you don't live in the district anymore that you want to run in, then it's like, okay, well, um, do I move? Like, <laughs> so that's, that's been a, a, big, a big issue. We've been keeping track of this as much as we can. Um, there's actually a redistricting committee with Pima County Democrats um, led by Susan Bickle. And you can find out more about that on our website. Um, but yeah, this is one of our biggest, our biggest worries. Um, some of our other concerns uh, are voting restriction laws. So specifically SB 1485. So this removes voters from the active early voter list um, if they have not voted at least once in four election cycles. Um, it's supposed to go into effect after the 2024 presidential election where they will receive a notice from their county recorder before they're actually removed from the list. But if they don't say anything, um, then they'll be removed from the list and they can still vote, but they just won't receive a ballot in the mail. And this can be potentially devastating to Arizona races because like we were saying before, um, the higher the turnout, the, sl the slimmer the margins. And even with 
the relatively lower turnout in 2018, there were still really, really close races that were decided by just a few thousand votes. Um, and so potentially what this could do is cut actual votes cast within Pima County by 7,000. Um, Cause if you were to take the 77% um, of Pima County voters who cast their votes by mail, um, and let's say 3% of them are considered to be inactive voters and are removed from the list. That's potentially 14,000 voters who would no longer be voting by mail. And because voting by mail actually doubles your chances of voting, we can say that um, you know, 14,000 voters who no longer can vote by mail, there's probably about 7,000 of those people who will end up not voting at all um, for whatever reason. Um, but these margins are just, they're too tight to, um, to allow this to happen essentially. Um, and so this is something that we're just, we're constantly thinking about. And so the more that we can activate voters and keep them engaged, the less likely this is going to happen. And then funding. So this is related to the uh, uh, We Can fundraiser um, that, that Larry had mentioned earlier. Um, so we have been steadily declining in terms of funding, um, especially because of the pandemic of uh, last year um, and currently, because it's still it's still going on. Um, we are not going to be having an in-person Udall dinner, nor are we going to have a virtual Udall dinner. Um, it's not going to be an in-person dinner because the venue that we normally would have it at, which is the uh, Desert Diamond Casino Resort. Um, it's it's a partnership that we have. It's a special kind of partnership that we have with the Tono Odom uh, Nation, and they are still not doing um, in person events, which you know we completely understand. Um, but if it's not going to be in person, we don't want to make it a virtual event because um, it's 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 something that uh, apparent like what we have discovered is having a virtual event and recruiting and um, uh, getting sponsors for something that's virtual is completely different from doing that for a, an in-person event. Um, it's a lot more difficult and it's it's just not what we want you all to be. Um, so that's so the, the next you all dinner is planned to be in hopefully of May of 2022. Um, we actually have been facing a, a lack of funding from unions because there are um, certain senators who do not support ending the filibuster, nor do they support passing the PRO Act. Um, and because of that, in the states of these senators, um, there has been very restricted um, funding from certain unions. Uh, so some unions who have supported us for you know 10 years or so um, have, uh, have said, you know, we're not going to be supporting you, which, you know, as the Pima County Democratic Party, we completely understand that. Um, we, we know that, you know, the, the filibuster stopping it is, is, it's essential to democracy and passing the PRO Act is something that, um, you know, we've been working towards for a century, basically. Um, but, you know, voter contact, it does have a financial cost, um, you know, whether it's cleaning our data, printing materials, um, paying our interns, um, paying to keep the lights on. Uh, these, are, these are real costs that um, we still need to um, cover. And so part of my job over the last few months has been working to find some creative solutions to this, uh, to this problem that we have. So um, in terms of next steps, what y'all can do to get involved and to um, help the Pima County Democratic Party, um, becoming a PC uh, is definitely, I think, one of the most impactful things that, that you can do for the 2022 um, campaign. PCs are our boots on the ground. Um, you, uh, you have this direct impact on your community that is um, completely unique. Um, and you know, our goal for right now is to get 20 new PCs appointed every month because the, um, the Republicans have gotten oh, a few. <laughs> They've gotten, I think they got 25 last month, um, which was crazy. But uh, yeah, the more PCs that we can have to start building that infrastructure with, with voter outreach and engagement, 
um, the the better it's going to be for us in the 2022 election. If you are already a, a PC, um, or if that's something that maybe there's uh, there's no available slots in your precinct, um, you know, becoming a volunteer. Uh, we always need help with managing the office. We need help with um, making phone calls, especially any any Spanish speakers that we have. Um, we make calls every day at our office, um, except for today because it's a holiday. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday from four to six. What our goal is, is to have um, a thousand dials completed every week, meaning, you know, one shift, quote unquote. So basically an hour, an hour and a half, uh, most volunteers can make about 40 dials. And so what we want is um, to have 25 of those shifts completed every week. So what that means is um, we want five volunteers in the office every day um, making calls most of these are volunteer recruitment or voter engagement calls. Um, but this is one of the, the biggest things that, that you can do if you wanna get involved. Um, and then also, if you're not already, please consider becoming a donor um, for about $83 a month, which is about $3 a day. Um, you can become a cat dem and give PCDP um, our regular source of income that we're finding is more and more essential, especially when you know, you can't have these these big events that are supposed to be like your main source of fundraising for the year. So like Udall, for example, what if you can't have Udall? Well, then you need to find uh, another way. Um, something else that you can do if you haven't already um, is to consider purchasing a ticket to our July 17th CAN event. Um, we're, okay, it's about, it's closer to 7,500 now. Um, we're about 7,500 away from our $10,000 goal. Um, so any, any tickets that you would like to buy or um, any sponsorships that you would like to consider giving, um, definitely uh, please check out our website where you, can, where you can do that. And then these are some upcoming events. We actually, we just had our office opening on Friday. Um, our next uh, strategy session, which is something like this, except it's in person, um, it's me. And I have a, you know, a slide presentation kind of like this. Um, it's actually going to be next Sunday, um, and that's going to be at uh, the social hour starts at 3.30, and then my actual presentation starts at 4. Um, we have the, the We Can fundraiser, which is uh, July 17th. It's, it's a virtual fundraiser. Um, a county committee meeting is coming up on August 21st, so mark your calendars if you're a PC because you need to be there. And then we're having our Udall dinner, of course, in May of 2022. All right, questions. Miranda, I missed that part about the next strategy session. Um, that's a virtual event with you. It's actually an in-person event. It's at our office, the Pima County Democratic Headquarters. And so you can go to this link to sign up. And this is actually a way to sign up for, um, you can sign up for as many sessions as you'd like, uh, but it's something I've been trying to do. So every other Sunday, you know, I want to make sure that if anyone has any questions about what it is that the Pima County Democrats are doing, or if they are wondering how to get involved, that we can answer those questions and just kind of give you more information in general about what's going on, because there's, there's a lot of information. <laughs> right. And so then with the PC, we're new PCs um, mm -hmm. here in LD3, and the, the meeting you were talking about in August, that's on the 21st, and that's virtual. Yes, and that's a virtual meeting, and the invitations for that are going to go out probably towards the end of this upcoming week. Um, that's something that we've been working on is making sure that um, all of the PCs get a notice about that, whether it's email, phone, or having something sent in the mail. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right, next up we have Shirley Muni. Shirley, go right ahead. Several years ago when I was a young go gung-ho PC, I did not, I was wanted to go door to door in my precinct, did not have handouts because you, you, do, you don't just go present yourself. And I stopped by the headquarters. At that time, I saw stacks of handouts, including door hangers. And I said, I'd love to have some of those for my precinct. And they said, oh no, you can't have those. Those are for the coordinated campaign. 
Well, I took some anyhow because I had no other materials from county party to hand out in my precinct. So how coordinated is the coordinated campaign? Are they working with the local precincts, the local county parties to provide materials for the PCs? Yeah. And so I think, are you talking about, was it 2018 by chance that you were talking about? It was probably before that. Before 2018, it was... It was called the coordinated, but it really wasn't at all. And so what we are doing is to um, hopefully avoid any of the situations this upcoming year. Um, and the way that that works or that is going to work is that um, I have actually been checking in weekly with the coordinated campaign organizing director. Um, and so kind of getting updates from her on where she's at with hiring, um, what their um, organizing strategy looks like. Um, I'm also in really close contact with the coordinated campaign director, Sean, um, and talking to him about when their data is going to be up and running um, and how they're getting like their funding and um, how all of that's going to work. I know that both of them have been in contact um, with all of the, well, they've, they've reached out to all of the LD chairs um, in the state. Um, they haven't gotten responses back from a few of them, but they have like reached out to introduce themselves and to make sure that, you know, the LD chairs know who, who they are. Um, and so it's, it's it's, a lot of that just, just didn't happen, um, before 2018. And even in 2018 and 2020, it was very limited, um, when they did do that, um, because there was, um, there was a lot of you know, miscommunication and there wasn't um, as much of an effort to be, you know, actually coordinated. Um, but I can say that, and and I, I firmly believe that this year is going to be really different. Um, the people who are involved um, are just some of the most hardworking people that I know personally. Um, and they know that it's really important to me that they are the ones who take responsibility for, you know, providing those resources and not just coming in and taking over and then not giving us anything. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We have a question from John Yocom. Go right ahead. Well, I guess I'd just like to say that I'm really tired that Pima County keeps electing Democrats to the state legislature. And every year we get here that we've come up just short again. So I guess the real problem isn't in uh, Pima County. It's in, the other legislative districts throughout the state, they're the ones that are not electing as many Democrats as we are. I believe that if we were to put all of our efforts into electing Democrats to the state legislature, to the state Senate and House, then everything else falls in place. If we uh, get Democrats elected in all the LDs, then Mark Kelly and gets reelected and Katie Hobbs becomes governor. And everything else falls in place. Is that a possible strategy? Is, is that just me dreaming with legal marijuana or do, is it possible? No, no, no. It's, um, it's, no, it's definitely, um, I would say it's part of the strategy. Um, that is definitely the strategy of the Pima County Democrats. That's the strategy of the ADLCC. Um, it is not the strategy of the coordinated campaign, um, mostly for reasons that involve current kind of the, the national party um, and how the national party is investing. But um, what we're hoping is that instead of ignoring our strategies or taking resources away from our strategies, what instead we're going to be doing with the coordinated campaign um, is working alongside them so that our strategies, not only do they not cancel each other out, but they actually um, enhance each other and they, um, they make each other more effective. Like they focus on the top of the ticket and we put all of our efforts into focusing down the ticket. All right. We have a question from Joe Danishevsky. Go right ahead, Joe. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. Uh, thanks, Miranda. A lot of great information. How much has the party uh, netted from the Udall dinner? In 2019, there was actually more made from the mayoral inaugural lunch than the Udall dinner. Um, I believe that year the inaugural lunch made 80,000 and the Udall dinner made 60, 60,000. 
And then the year after the Udall dinner, I think there was about 50,000 that was made. And a lot of those, a lot of that was because um, by the time it was decided that the Udall dinner was going to be virtual instead of in person, um, people had already bought their tickets. Sponsors had already, um, you know, committed to giving to the event. Um, and, and most of the money was, was kept rather than returned. Most people said, it's fine. You just keep the money. Okay. Thank you. And, you know, there's a number of not-for-profits in Pima County, as well as charities that are making virtual fundraising work. And I, I would be more than willing to sit down with you and talk about that. And I, I'd hate to see uh, another year go by a year we, where we really need the money for resources. That's a good chunk of change to pass up on. Yeah, I agree. Tucson apparently has the highest density of nonprofits in the United States. So like even more than, than New York, there's a lot of competition out here. That's, that's become one of our biggest challenges is figuring out how do we navigate in this semi post COVID world? Not really though, because you know, the Delta variant might be coming back. And I think a lot of it is us needing to make more phone calls, um, asking more volunteers to help us with those phone calls. Um, Because that's really, apart from knocking on doors, that's really the most effective way to get people involved and to get them to pledge is to talk to them on the phone. Thanks. All right. Barbara Warren has her hand up. Barbara, please go ahead. Miranda, you're young enough that younger than all of us here and, and very much will value this question even more than the rest of us, but we all should care. One of the things that you didn't talk about is the last item on the ballot. And that is uh, the the election of the Corporation Commission measures. Those are the people who are in the best position to do anything about addressing global climate change by changing regulations in terms of the fuels we use and uh, regulating the uh, fossil fuel industry and so forth. How is the party going to support the candidates for the Corporation Commission? I I have another question, and that is when's the next election for... uh, re-election for PCs. Actually, Sandra Kennedy, we have her petitions at the office because she's going to be running again for corporate commissioner. And so she's also going to be speaking at our uh, We Can fundraiser. So the ones who we know for sure are democratically inclined, we are definitely actively working with them. It, it, It would be I think, a a very interesting project to introduce to the the Young Dems Task Force, which is essentially the the youth committee of the Pima County Democratic Party. Um, They actually just had an in-person event uh, for Pride Month, and they had a couple of speakers there. And I think that that would be a really interesting thing for them to take on is to um, create events and create awareness within the people in their circles um, about corporate commissioner. And, and why it's so important. Um, and then to answer your, your second question, um, I thought the election was going to be this year in August. Turns out it's going to be next year in August. So my Thank bad. You. Thank you. And I've got a question for you, Miranda, and it concerns recruiting candidates. Yeah, I think the key thing to flipping the legislature is to getting really good legislative, uh, state legislative candidates. What is the party doing to recruit candidates? So that's kind of twofold because we have candidates who we're trying to uh, recruit them to run in 2022, but then we also have candidates that we are preparing in the event that um, current representatives resign before their um, uh, before their term is over. Um, statewide, there are about 18 or 19 um, spots in the House and the Senate that people are expected to uh, leave before um, the next session starts, um, just because of how volatile this last session was. Um, So for those people, um, it's a little bit different. We wanna make sure that when they are nominated by their LD, um, that they have like the relevant, you know, experience and drive and everything like that. Um, But in terms of like actually Recruiting for next year, probably our biggest worries um, are LDs, probably LD2 is our is our biggest worry um, in terms of like finding someone to to run. 
Uh, but, you know, we've been reaching out to a lot of people who are knowledgeable um, about potential candidates um, who may want to run. Um, people like, you know, Ron Barber and um, uh, Bill Rowe, um, people who have like been involved for a while and who might know someone who knows someone. Um, but yeah, that's that's definitely been something I've been learning about a lot. All right. Got a quick question from Steve Linder. Go ahead, Steve. Hi, yeah, um, because of some of the horrible laws that were passed in this last session, one of the ways that um, is being coordinated to fight against them is to put them on the ballot and uh, have voters have their say in, in 22. But because of that, they, 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 there's a very quick turnaround of signatures. And at least if you get, you get those signatures, there none of these laws can go into effect until voters get to vote on them. My question is, what is the uh, county doing about coordinating getting signatures? And I think what you might be referring to is the Arizona Deserves Better campaign to where they need to get signatures within the next 90 days. Um, and that's their website right there that I put in the chat. It explains a lot more. But essentially, we, we have their petitions available at our office. What we might actually start doing is to try to go out to um, places like, you know, libraries and, and such where people can actively collect signatures and not just like come into the office and sign it. But that's going to depend on where they would need the most help. Question from Jeannie Christie, who put it in the chat. She says, hopefully Legislative District 11 will be broken up. That's where Mark Fincham and Vince Leach are from. She mentions that, you know, we had a really good candidate, Joanna Mendoza, running for state Senate in 2020, but we all know how that turned out. Eventually, Leach was elected, you know, and he's a QAnon supporter. Miranda, what, what do you see about the, the future of uh, LD11? I mean, based off of what I've been hearing other people saying and based off of um, what we've been hearing in the redistricting committee, um, because they actually haven't even started to draw lines yet. They are waiting for some census data to come back, which they're probably going to get in August. Um, and then they're actually going to start like drawing maps and, and things like that. What I have been hearing is that it is probably LD9 that's going to be broken up. Um, it's the, the most likely to be broken up. Um, I'm sure LD11 will change um, and the demographics are hopefully going to change because I, I agree. It's it's just one of those areas that um, we, we've never quite been able to get a hold of, but if there were some, even like the smallest difference in, in terms of what it looked like, it'd be so much easier to try to get someone. Sorry, that was a really non-answer to your question. <laughs> well, there are a lot of unknowns. Let me turn to uh, Susie Anderson, who will be our last questioner of the day. We're coming up on one o'clock. Go ahead, Susie. Hi there. Um, my question is, how do we take back LD4? You know, we have a fight every year with LD11, and we've, we've posted some great candidates, but how do we take back the seat that we lost in LD4? That's a great question, and that's um, one of, uh, at least Bonnie and I's, um, one of our biggest concerns is getting that seat back. Um, there, there's currently um, one person who has said that um, he plans on, on running, um, Aram Katz. Um, I'm not sure if you, um, have heard of him or not. He just got his, um, website, um, up and running. Um, but in terms of getting the seat back, uh, we are going to be, you know, kind of redoubling our efforts on increasing voter contact in LD4, um, as well as LD14, because we feel like those two are the, the LDs that kind of get, not left out, but, you know, don't get as much attention as some of the other LDs do. So increasing voter contact, which will hopefully increase the, uh, the voter turnout in the election. All right. Thank you very much, Miranda. It's been very informative hearing from you today. I wondered if you would wrap up our meeting for us. Tell us uh, how people can get a hold of you and what they, would, what they should do if they're looking to support your efforts. Yeah, so um, I just put my uh, email and my phone number in the chat there. So my email is director at pimadems.org. And my phone number is 480-628-4657. And that's my cell phone. 
um, please feel free to text me um, or call me anytime. Um, I mean, this is what I do for a living is to talk to people like you guys and to um, let you know how you can best get involved. Um, and, you know, those three ways that we talked about. So become a PC, volunteer and become a donor. That's uh, that's really how you can you can help us with the Pima County Democratic Party. All right, Miranda, thank you very much. We appreciate your time and I'm happy so many people attended. And with that, I'm gonna draw the meeting to a close and I look forward to seeing you next Monday at noon. Until then, take care. <laughs>